Hello and welcome to Dungeoneered, a podcast dedicated to discussing Dungeons and Dragons. I'm Aaron. And I'm Josh. So Josh, like every week, I have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. So you're going to have to kind of uh, jump into it and explain a little bit what we're, what we're going for. What our topic is for this week. Uh, so this week, I was planning on talking about Abolis. Now, to explain Abolis, I kind of got to start with where they're from. Uh, they're from a place called the Far Realms. And the Far Realms are kind of unknowable. They're horrifying spaces where the rules that we come to expect in life just don't exist. So it's probably going to be like a, a topic that we probably are going to have to do later because I have no idea what the Far Realms even are, <laughs> like at all. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how explainable it is, but I will definitely see look into it. One of the things I've heard about the Far Realms is a wizard could go there and all of a sudden be two dimensional, or instead of growing teeth. You are now growing legs. Like, things don't make sense there. That's where most aberrations come from. These horrifying creatures that are look unearthly. And that is why the Abolith come from there. There are also things called the Elder Evils. They also come from before time or before recorded history. An Elder Evil most people who play D&D would know is Hadar. Like, those spells, Arms of Hadar and whatnot, those are from a Elder Evil creature. I thought they were just spells from, like, a wizard who was, like, really good at doing spells. Wait, you didn't know Hadar is an actual thing? No. I Isn't that one of, like, the major way. points of High Rollers, which you're no. a huge fan of? Because Hadar is coming? Yeah, but I didn't... I didn't Hadar is a like horrifying... Actual, I didn't know it was, like, an actual D&D &D thing. Yeah, Hadar is listen, an actual D and D I, thing. I know, I I know nothing. I know. I thought he was just a, a famous wizard or something who made spells that were creepy and tentacly. Uh, no, no, that's not what it was. It's an actual horrifying creature. Uh, actually, my next campaign <laughs> oh. it said in a nation I've named uh, Piranu. That one is dealing with a lot of elder evils. So I, I, instead of dealing with Hadar like uh, they've done in High Rollers and whatnot, I'm doing uh, Caffin, who is like his second in command person. Do Elder Evils have, like, slap -lock? Do they have slap I don't locks? think so. Uh, I, I think they're like gods in that sense, where they're like, no player should go against these creatures. Ah, got it. Got it, got it, got it. Now, Abolis are large, slimy, horrifying, psychic aberrations that dwell in deep, dark waters. Here's the description from the Forgotten Realms wiki. Abolis were fish-like amphibians of immense size, often reaching 20 feet in length, and weighing up to 6,500 pounds. That's actually close to like three tons. Though they continued to grow as they aged, and some fantastical ancient specimens might reach 40 feet in length. They resembled a bizarre eel with long tubular bodies, as well as a tail at one end and two fins near the head, and another along the back. Abolith mouths were like lampreys, filled with serrated, jawless teeth. They have these three red eyes lined up in a row on their face as well. I think the craziest thing about aboliths, aboliths? though... Are there different types of aboliths? Not really. Um, I mean, they, they, they're they visual differences, such as um, some of them have two of these holes uh, that kind of act like mouths. Other of them have four others have six eight whatever like they've high amounts of these holes and actually the more holes they that one abolith has the more eloquent it is because their language requires multiple mouths to speak and the more mouths you can you have the more kind of verbose and bigger words you can use so the abolith that i sent put a picture in discord only has two of those holes and that's like a very basic speaker and it's actually nearly impossible for any like oh, humanoid okay. any basic humanoid like we have on Toral to speak abolith because you require multiple mouths and we just don't have that that's but, so weird <laughs> it is but it's one of those things that it makes sense for another race where that's a thing now the craziest thing about abolith is their mucus it is constantly secreted from them when they are underwater this is what the 5th edition has boiled the ability down to, called Mucus Cloud. While underwater, the abolith is surrounded by transformative mucus. A creature that touches the abolith or hits it with a melee attack within 5 feet of it must make a DC 14 constitution saving throw. On a failure, 
The creature is diseased for 1d4 hours. The diseased creature can breathe only water. Wow. That's... So it gives you a disease where you can only breathe water? Yes. Now, that is a really gamey way of saying what this horrifying mucus does. It's That is really just the start of it. Your skin starts changing. It becomes translucent and slimy. Your skin becomes like that so that it is able to take in water. So you're breathing through your skin instead of just your, your mouth. This is That's permanent. so gross. Yeah, it is. This is permanent unless cured within one minute. After that minute, you must use a healing spell of 6th level or higher to revert back. But in D&D lore, 99% of the population doesn't have access to 6th level spells. So it would be nearly impossible to, for any sort of low level person to even try to heal this. So it's a very deadly ability. Yeah, but dang. this ability is necessary for these mainly aquatic creatures because... It is how they can turn any humanoid into enslave them into their servant, and they can still serve them under the water. So essentially their disease like allows them to enslave people to a better degree. Uh, no, their psychic ability enslaves them. The, the mucus just turns them into the perfect slaves, so they can live in the same place as the abolists live. That's so great. That's so messed also, up. Also, it makes them incredibly delicious which is a fun thing I had to learn this week. Wait, what? Wait. Wait, you ate an abolith this week? <laughs> I'm kidding. No, Wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, the mucus makes the humanoid incredibly delicious. The transformation that it does to your the human skin and whatnot, it literally turns it into like a delicacy. That's, that's so like, gross. It's like putting dressing on something. <laughs> That also literally sounded like you just said you ate a humanoid covered in mucus and you learned that <laughs> it was delicious. Because <laughs> abolists are real, which if anybody didn't know that, I'm, I'm sorry to break that to you now. Yeah, there are a reason why people are afraid of the ocean, man. <laughs> exactly. <Can't go> <laughs> abolists. <laughs> uh, abolists also have tentacles. And they attack with these tentacles. And I don't think this is included in the stat block, but if you are hit by those tentacles, you still have to make a roll against this mucus because it's still touching you. Yeah, it's on the it's on the stat block that I'm looking at currently. Okay. Now, one of the weird things about Abolith, uh is that I found an insane, a frankly insane amount of stuff about how the internal organs and whatnot of the Abolith actually work. <laughs> Who takes the time to write out how organs work in a mysterious? Sea well, creature. actually, a lot. There, there are a few older monsters that I've found stuff like this for, and it's always weird when I do. Uh, one of the the major ones that I I found was uh, mimics have a whole bunch of stuff about everything that lets them change color and lets them look this way and whatnot, and they make it all a biological function. Huh. Now, the reason why they would do this that I have found is that they are spell components. So when you explain all the organs then a, an adventuring party would be like, okay, I know we want the that one that able that's able to do the pigments for a mimic, and that's going to cost a lot of money, so we can get that out and whatnot. I don't know if the... I, I, have, I don't know when these were made, where they go in-depth on what organs are in them, so I don't know if it's a modern thing or if it's from original d and I'm going to be honest. I wasn't listening to anything that you said because I was eating goldfish, and I just thought, man, I'm eating little gold apples. <laughs> oh, man. There's your bird again. Yeah, it's true. It's because I'm eating goldfish, and she got excited. Uh, no, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about all the bodily organs. I'm going to avoid most of that. But I will tell you, they have a heart solely. They have two hearts. One is solely for the purpose of pumping blood to their brain because their brain is one of the most important things for an Avalith. Their memories are absolutely incredible. They do not forget anything, and they remember everything that their ancestors knew. What? How everything, they... everything that their ancestors found out or every memory they experienced, when they have kids, the kids remember all of it. That would suck. In what way? Knowing everything your parents know? That'd be real weird. <laughs> Well, I think if it's if it's your race and it's all you've ever known, like it's that's just how your species works. I don't think it'd be that bad. But 
I guess, but it's just super, super weird to me. Well, so one of the things that would be not terrible about it is that uh, they don't have to worry about their par- knowing how their parents had sex because they're uh, they do that all by themselves. They lay their eggs and they fertilize it themselves. <laughs> oh man! So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> That's what I was worried about. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> Uh, well, they do that all by themselves, so there's no reason to worry anymore. Yeah. Uh, all right, and, so then it probably wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. They have a part of their brain, the ventral lobe, where all their memory is stored and where their the memories of their ancestors are stored. And as they grow, as they get older and older and older, which abolists actually are pretty much immortal, the only way they can die is by being killed, like stabbed in the heart or whatever or a disease otherwise they're gonna live forever so the older and older the abolith gets the bigger and bigger and bigger the ventral lobe grows because for them it doesn't actually stop growing ever and so there are some that reach all the way to their tails which that's 20 to 40 feet back wow yeah that's every time they get more (laughs) knowledge it grows and grows and they get knowledge through their ancestors and through eating humanoids. It's kind of like... Uh, uh, have you have you ever seen the uh, movie uh, Warm Bodies? Is that the zombie movie? Yeah, the zombie Twilight-like movie about the romancing a zombie. Yeah, I've never seen it, but I, I remember seeing something about it. Okay, well, the main actor, Nicholas Holt, is amazing. But besides that... Um... Why? Because he remembers what his parents remember from birth. <laughs> I hope not. Oh, that would be horrifying. Um, <laughs> but no, so yeah, in, in that world, the zombies, they kind of, because you you watch most of the movie from the zombies' perspective, uh, so they kind of explain what zombies are doing, why they're wanting brains and whatnot. And it's because it makes them feel alive. When they eat it, they kind of get the emotions and memories of the previous the, the whoever they're eating and it it's kind of addictive and uh, delicious and so it's it's not they don't get everything they get flashes and they get like major emotions and it's the same way for the abolis they don't get everything but they get those major big emotional moments that just really nourish them and so that's why when abolis are looking for something to eat they're going to go for a intelligent humanoid over just some fish so if you were trying to fish for an abolith, you would put a human on the end of a hook and just throw him overboard, pull him behind the boat? I would not suggest that, because I don't think you could lower the human low enough in the water. Ah, that's the problem. Got They're it. They're very deep. <laughs> they, they, they live very deep in the water. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. You know, not that's the only... On hook. Yeah, that's the only reason. That's the only problem with this. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah, we wouldn't have enough line to reach as far down as they live. Yeah, and humans are a little too buoyant. You got to get some sort of like cement on their feet or something, you know. Well, well yeah, the obviously classics. you would like, you know, tie iron balls to their feet or something, but you know. No, Abolis. Anyways, are... Abolis like brain smoothies. Yes. Now, Abolis are very into themselves and see themselves as better than the rest for reasons that we'll dive into later. So they rarely deal with other races. They don't. They they see themselves as above it, and they don't want to. But there is one race that they have been known to make deals with. That is the Illithid, or the Mind Flayer. I thought you were going to say halflings. <laughs> yes, halflings. The make halflings deals with everybody. are the one race that Ablith will will deal with. No, it's the Mind Flayers. Now, the reason for this is that they are very similar in many ways. They have a very similar mindset about enslaving humanoids and seeking knowledge but the biggest reason is fear abolis only fear one thing the unknown because they have all the knowledge of themselves and their ancestors the unknown is the only thing scary to them even the gods because they saw the creation of the gods gods are not scary to them at all i thought you were going to say having their brain get eaten nope now mind flayer history is crazy and I'm going to skip over most of it because uh, that is my planned topic for next week. But in short, I will say that they 
kind of popped into existence fairly recently. And so the Aboleth has seen the creation of, as I said earlier, the gods and almost every other human humanoid race. These guys just came out of nowhere, and that's scary. And so they want them on their side, and they want to learn more about them. So they team up every so often, which is really a detriment to most adventurers. Because the Aboleth and the Mind Flayers would be a very formidable enemy. Can Aboleths go up on land? So they have a 10-foot walking speed? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect them to do that a lot because their mucus cloud uh, doesn't really come out when they're not in the water. Yeah, that makes but, sense. But they don't need to breathe as we do. They just need that mucus secretion to respirate. I'm not sure exactly how they do that, but like they don't breathe water. So when they're in water, they're not breathing. So they kind of don't really, it, they would be fine on land if they wanted to. Now, as I said, they were from the beginning, the time before time, which a way to explain that is just before written history. They were alien to this world coming from the far realms, a frontier of chaos. The most insane things happen to anyone who steps there, as I explained earlier. Now, little is known of their empire because it was, as I said, before written history. Even, even gods don't know how long they reigned, where they reigned, things like that, because they weren't even created then. But an Aboleth escaped from the Far Realm into Aber Toril before anything else was there. It was all water, and there was no light at all. This salt Aboleth was, as I said earlier, able to reproduce by itself. So, over time, Aboleths spread across the whole of Aber Toril, and they created a paradise for themselves, really, building up great strength as a race. And when this second age came, called the Blue Age, that is the time where the gods came into being and the sun came to illuminate the planet. And that was also when the Dawn War started, which was the one between the gods and the primordials. By that point, they'd already established such a powerful empire that as races were being created, Avalos were immediately enslaving them. And the biggest issue they ran into is once they enslaved all these people, the gods were there. And the slaves started to pray and started to have faith and, and believe in these gods that were now there. And the gods, as we've talked about earlier, gained strength based on how many people are following them. And so, and especially the fervor of that worship. And when these people are enslaved, they're going to have very, very fervorous <laughs> worship and belief. And so the gods grew very powerful and began to take pity on these people that had started following them. So they came together, and they smited all of the Aboleth Empire in one fell swoop together. And that was when the Day of Thunder began, which is the time period where the gods rose a landmass from the sea, which started, which was like their Pangaea, which we talked about previously. And that is what we know for now, as the Aboleth have been smited by the gods, their empire scattered, but all of them that are still alive remember every great day that Aboleth had, and their terrible defeat, and every single thing that they lost that day as if it was yesterday. And so they all are angry and mad at the gods in Toril, the world that we, that D and D is set. So it's it'll any day now they could be done with their planning and attack. Okay, so let me get this straight. They made a bunch of slaves. The slaves were desperate and started praying to gods. The gods got powerful, found pity on the slaves, then killed all well as many Abilith as they could, I guess, destroyed and shattering their empire. And now yeah, Abolith they shattered the their empire. The they didn't. Sea. They didn't explain a lot about how they did that. If they, I mean, because there are, but literally, all you need is one Abolith to live to restart the whole thing because they can reproduce by themselves. So, so now Abolith then just sit at the bottom of the sea, plotting the gods' demise. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And they, <laughs> they live in, they're like places in dungeons where they have deep, deep, deep lakes and dungeons. And like Kuatoa serve them there. Or there are other places where other aquatic creatures have been enslaved by the Aboleth and their psychic abilities. That's 
wild. <laughs> That's yep. crazy. And they're like one of the first creatures on the stat block in like for in the monster manual. One of the, like the first page is Aarakocra. The next page is Abolith. And they just look like these tentacly fish people. But yeah, I mean, so much more. It, yeah, just looking at it on the stat block, it's like you just think they're like some sort of evil fish that just, you know, lives at the bottom of the sea and eats people. Not like have this whole huge background of a shattered fallen empire where they are angry at the gods now and now plot their demise. Like you just, <laughs> just look it, at them and they're like, ah, oh, you just, you know, find one down while you're trying to swim at the bottom of the ocean. They're, they're such great story hooks for like, if any if, intended. <laughs> if you ever need like uh, some ancient knowledge to be discovered by the party and the gods don't even know it abelis would probably know it cuz it would be from a time they they ruled or they were there and so there's yeah, well, they just they're so interesting and so usable in so many different ways i mean like right when you were talking about it the first thing that i kind of thought of and i kind of wrote it down a little bit was just to like make like a dungeon up in the mountains that was once underwater but was like land shifting and moving had now pushed its way up and it was like an old abolis structure or something and inside is still water like there's still water inside so they start like in land and then make their way down to eventually they have to start swimming and they find an ancient abolith down at the bottom who has been living there with you know slaves or whatever for since their empire was shattered and destroyed which i think would be a really really fun dungeon to make like, and why that would be really cool. Yeah, why is there a structure up here with like salt water in it? You know. Yeah, that would. Yeah, and and they would the the creature would just have to have found a way to get followers and whatnot because he can't go to the ocean. He can never go there, so he's got to make do with what he's got. Yeah, like you just have this insane abolith that's stuck in the like stuck in his fortress. And now just, there is insane in the lore. There is the coolest Avalith of all time called simply Eldest. He is an Avalith of massive size and incalculable age and inconceivably malignancy. He ruled the greatest city of the Avalith and now he lives in Toral somewhere in the ocean. This incredibly massive, horrifying Avalith who has lived. Some say from the very beginning of Abolith culture, and he's just down there. <laughs> so creepy. Oh man, if you're not afraid of the ocean in real life, you would be in D D life. Holy you should man. be in D D life. Like there's so many things in D D that kill you in, in the ocean, a place where it's really hard to do stuff. Yeah, it's objectively terrifying in D. &D. <laughs> yes, it really, really is. You literally have giant slime creatures that turn you into slaves. Now, one of the things they also love to do, just like Mind Flayers, is they kind of take creatures and just mess around with their DNA and create better and better slaves for themselves. And so they created the Chull, C-H-U-U-L, these kind of insectoid, crustacean tentacle monsters and that are... They're, they're very good at going on land and on sea. And yeah, they, they are, like, they are they rough. They like lobsters. Well, yeah. So the thing is, is that's all I thought it was. Was it just a crustacean and sort of tentacle monster? But uh, it's actually part insectoid. Because at one point it was even more insectoid looking. And at one point it even looked like a worm. But they have refined it to what the 5th edition image shows. With these kind of pincers kind of chitinous body and this tentacly mouth. So the abolists just kind of like messed with their DNA until they started making the best slaves possible. Yeah. So messed up. That's all <laughs> that's I mean they have infinite amount of time down at the bottom of the ocean to just do that. It could also be a fun thing to do in like the dungeon that I was talking about earlier. Have like some sort of weird creature that it's slowly made. Like it has one slave and it has slowly turned it over time to something completely crazy and creepy. Because it, it really needs fun. more it has more needs that it needs to be served. And so it try just every time it needs something, just edit his old slave to be perfect for whatever new thing he needs it. Yeah, and if you're trying to like introduce your party to like like a, a 
I don't know what D and D realms there are, but like a realm of only water, like a deep sea. I don't know, like if there's even a thing in D and D. But if you were trying to introduce your party to something like that, that could be how the Ablith is living. Like there's a partial portal, but the Ablith hasn't figured out how to like fully open it, and so still mm -hmm. fish and things are able to make its way in for him to eat. But they have, yeah. he hasn't fully figured out how he could open to escape his dungeon, his prison, essentially. And then yeah. he slowly turned the slaves he has into crazy genetically modified beings that are just insane. Like, <laughs> they've lost their mind and have gone wacko. That would be really interesting. Now, the the fun thing about that type of a dungeon is that at the end, if the, the party has a chance of convincing this, what should be a creature that would never even sort of work with the humanoid to work with it because if they can do something he hasn't been able to do like open that portal fully then they would get a chance to talk to this creature who would normally never even give them the time of day because they have a he's he needs to escape and they're his only chance yeah that would be a super fun thing to like play off of and work with how the party has now come to like not befriend, but make a, a deal, essentially, with a creature that has essentially never made a deal with humans unless it's enslaved them. Yeah. How many aboliths are there in the D&D &D world now? Do we know? Is it just, like, no. a few? No. The whole the whole point is that there, there could be millions down there that we have no idea about. I mean, you could make a whole campaign about that if you wanted. Yes. Now, actually, a fun little spoiler for you. In our campaign with Chris, uh, I am playing a water genasi uh, paladin druid. And I loved this story about the Aboleth and their empire so much and their anger at the gods that an Aboleth being angry at my god, who is a god of the sea, is part of my backstory. Ah, that's pretty cool. So you were like in an Aboleth temple? Uh, I was. We were attacked and slaughtered by Avalith as That's we tried cool. to reach cool. a temple that had fallen underwater for my god. Try to reclaim it. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. Like, do you know? Does your character know the Avalith? Does it have like a name? It was I was thinking it'd be multiple of them, but I don't. I don't. Chris and I haven't firmed that up because it's not hasn't become important yet. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah. As I discover these things, I'm like. I like this. I want to throw this in somewhere. And so I'm like, where can I throw this in? Where can I use this cool knowledge? And so I, I throw it into a character creation or a world creation. It doesn't always have to be world creation to to create a cool story out of the lore. No, I mean, yeah, you can use this for character creation like you did. And I also just really like the idea of like a, a fallen empire that was once powerful and all like all knowing, essentially. So if you really needed to get your players to like know something or find something or explore an ancient ruin or relics they can definitely like try and seek out abolis or something to that effect risk yeah. risk the risk the necessary danger to find knowledge now the whole the, one of the biggest things about abolis is that there's kind of this unknown to them this it was a land before time type thing where it's before time, before we knew about it, we're barely learning about it here and there and slowly. And so part of it is this idea of having a bit of lore or at least some really well fleshed out bits that then kind of imply more without having to create more lore. Hmm. So do you have an abolith that's in your world, like a, a an abolith that like roams the bottom of the seas or anything like that? Uh, I haven't, not officially. Um, I have one planned for a one shot where we kind of do a return one shot where everybody's level 20 from our old campaign, but I haven't thrown one at the party yet. Now, uh, one of the things that I really liked about the story that I really wanted to kind of bounce off you and see what your ideas were is the idea of these aboliths having these slaves and the slaves being the one to kind of bring about their downfall, and these, the slaves worshipping these gods that then take pity on them. I loved that whole dynamic and how that took place. Uh, what would be a fun way to add that into a world or kind of use that? Well, I mean, the, the first thing that kind of comes to my mind immediately, which would be kind of similar to the same thing we talked about in the first episode, but like a Dragonborn society, where, um, like 
there are two different types of dragonborns like tail and tailless or whatever and uh those like say tailless is put to slaves and they start worshiping to like ancient dragon to like rescue them from their from their servitude and their slavery and the ancient mm-hmm. dragons come and rescue them but then put them in chains i think that'd be a really fun a really fun thing to to just throw in your world as a something a little bit of something extra but i mean you could do all sorts of stuff you could do any kind of society you could just you could just literally take that but put it on land <laughs> and then you have a whole a whole campaign or a whole story whole nation even just throw it into your campaign but move it to the land as humanoid species Hmm. I mean, it was a humanoid species technically, but yeah, but just kind of like transferring it onto land, so it's easier for your party to interact with. So, say humans yeah. enslaved elves, or the other way around, or anything like that, and then they prayed to their gods, and their gods freed them. You could even then go into like they tried to free them, but the gods were then killed by the elves or by the humans or whatever, like whoever enslaved them. So, like the people prayed to their gods. The gods tried to intervene, but the society that enslaved them became so powerful that they like killed the gods. And then you have like this whole godless world because the gods tried to intervene and save, but the society became too strong. A lot of interesting things with the Abolith. And I would, I love that idea of this race that is not above the gods, but thinks it is and feels like it deserves to be just as powerful as them. And it's kind of always plotting in the background. And it doesn't even have to be like your big bad, this group. Just making it at one point a, a plot point, like maybe a high level mission or something you have to go on is to kind of just check out where these guys are at. And if you're, this is not going to help most people, but if you're helping, going for a multi, multi game, multi campaign group that you're going to play multiple campaigns with, having like, each group just have one of those missions where they're like, you got to see what they're doing. Then the next group, you got to see what they're doing. And then the third group is the one who has to actually deal with it would be a really fun way of kind of having that continuity through the campaigns. Yeah. To kind of like intertwine the campaigns. Yeah. Kind of a fun thing to do. And just kind of everybody knows Aboliths or whatever you want it to be in your world is always plotting. They all know that. And so they all, every nation kind of has it on the back of their mind. So it doesn't matter where they are in the world. You can still have them go and check in on the Avalis. <laughs> I think that would be, be pretty cool. But I also, with when you were like talking about that, I also had this kind of idea of like a church betraying its own gods. So like a church was trying to summon gods for the express purpose of killing them because the, the gods had wronged them or had destroyed like the fragments of their church. Something like that would be a really fun idea too. Hmm. So like the party meets this like like say even the ruling church of a nation or something and they like get introduced to its like high priests and stuff and they're like yeah we're trying to you know get in contact with these gods and and essentially make it so the gods are closer to humanity than they they currently are but their whole end goal is to actually summon them and then kill them or like drain them of their power or capture them or something which I think would be a really fun idea to do too which you could actually combine last week's topic with this one and have it be they summon the gods to replace them to take the place of that god and once again restore power to their church like maybe it's a disenfranchised church that was technically like their ideas were too crazy for the the main church of the nation and so they were kind of kicked out being like no you're heretics you're a cult but they will try to take the place of the deity to then say, no, they are not the cult. They are the true followers and whatnot and raise them up to leadership. Right, and you could introduce like multiple different dynamics if you have like a cleric, especially in your party of like the cleric is worshiping this god and well, these people are trying to summon my god. That'd be really cool. And so they end up like helping them and then they realize or come to like the the understanding that their church is actually trying to like kill the god that they worship in air quotes, you know? Yeah. That would be a cool, cool story to dive into. And that's literally just taking the abolith and just putting it up on land instead of making it like a race of creatures, making it a church that worships gods. Which maybe having them some sort, some way, because I really like that idea of, of the abolith that remember 
because they remember everything that their ancestors remember, that means every single Aboleth remembers every single thing that they've lost, every great empire, every great city they had, everything they had. It, they remember every single one of them perfectly. I mean, I was And so that idea that of of doing like a transfer of knowledge or something for like the high priest of this cult where they get that knowledge and so even if like they're maybe the the old leader of this church dies while the party is helping them and so they have been kind of friends with this younger bishop or whatever and he's actually next in line and they're like oh good he's he's sensible and he'll be a good leader but when he goes through that ritual he learns everything that that previous person knew and has just as much vigor and evil intent as them because he knows and he's seen what what they lost yeah like i was i was thinking of like like an indoctrination ritual ceremony essentially where like the members of the church all gather around like the high priest and he like transfers his knowledge that he received from his past priests into like a, a essentially a ritual where then everybody begins like gets this knowledge passed down to them you know through this ritual and then you could make it the party has to stop this knowledge transfer ritual in order to break the vicious cycle of like wanting to kill the gods mm. I, I think it'd be really fun if it was a sort of like a a fountain of knowledge type thing where he kind of imbues his knowledge into this goblet or whatever and then they would like pass it around and so as P, the the group is like sneaking through the church or something they will see it and it, it, there's a possibility that one of the players could be like, I'll drink it. Yeah, like a, a, a well or like a fountain. Yeah, like you were saying, they, they they find it before they find the priest and like they can drink it if they want. And if they drink mm-hmm. it, they gain all these crazy memories and knowledge of what happened to the church. Yeah, I would, yeah, and just give them free proficiency in religion or something like that. That could be a really fun opportunity to have like to... And then you could easily frame the ritual around this whole well or fountain. Yes. The people are like having to all drink out of this fountain, like this fountain of knowledge, like these hidden secrets that no other church will tell you <laughs> type thing. It's like a, a one of those gotcha articles. Top 10 things the other church won't tell you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Top 10 secrets that you don't know about our God. Number six will surprise you. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be pretty good <laughs> and that's so you can even throw this into a funny campaign and make it a joke right exactly <laughs> like top 10 tenets of church number three is crazy <laughs> but just wait till you get to number 10 <laughs> yeah like <laughs> he's so dumb <laughs> he's so funny <laughs> clickbait church oh man that's the thing with silly D, you can do so much but i'm so into the role play that i i uh, i couldn't i couldn't say no to it just for the great laughs you could have with it <laughs> i could yeah i could do a maybe a one shot a silly one shot or something but i don't i don't i don't think i'd want to do like a whole campaign that was a silly campaign i don't think i could take it i, well, I couldn't take it seriously I would yeah my next campaign over. which if any of my players are listening I haven't told them that I do this podcast, but I will eventually. And if they are listening, you should stop because this is about the next campaign. The big bad is going to be a guy called uh, Rakdos, which is a, uh, I think he's an evil god or like an arch fiend from one of the, one of the newer, weirder modules that aren't technically d and It might be from the, um, the one with all like the Greek gods and stuff. And he is like a kind of god of fun and acting and debauchery and whatnot. And he is going to be the big bad of the next campaign. And the whole thing is going to be centered around like a kind of fake world that he has made. And him and this other god are kind of like fighting over it. So everything's going to be a little silly, or at least it's going to be lighter rules wise, because that's kind of what my party's looking for. And so, and so like when it comes to like spells, you won't have to, to buy the material component because in this world things are looser and things are funner. And so it, it kind of adds that way that they want to play into the story 
And so at one point they're going to be, they're going to give, be given the chance. Like, are you happy with this world? Or do you want to see what the real world's like? And it'll kind of be this interesting stuff. And so I might be able to throw something like (laughs) Buzzfeed church in there. (laughs) Yeah, which would be pretty funny. <laughs> the BuzzFeed Church. <laughs> Jeez. We're the great church of BuzzFeed. Yeah. Come worship at the feet of the buzz. That's pretty good. <laughs> all hail the feed. And they like constantly, they all have like tablets and whatnot that they're constantly scrolling through. Yeah, and they're all drinking coffee or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and again, if my players just if you came back stop listening again uh i'm gonna talk about a one shot we're gonna have and so in that one shot where you asked about the abolith my idea for that was actually the abolith has been it's one of like it's one of the big ones so it's gonna be like eldest and it's gonna have some cool name like that but (laughs) i'll have to think of one and he is trying to destroy the place where the gods have kind of taken their joy or at least get their their kicks. And so he's trying to destroy the whole continent, or at least sink it. And so because they're level 20 characters, this is like a thing that a level 20 characters have. They World-ending things are what they need to deal with. And so this Ableth will be trying to take down the world. Take down what, what they see as their world. The whole campaign continent that they've been on the whole campaign take it down to the ground. Yeah, I think that'd be super fun, like having a whole camp, like not a whole campaign, but a one-shot based off of this Ableth essentially trying to sink your your world, like drown it in the depths of the ocean so that he can get revenge on the gods and its people. Yeah, I make terrain, and so I've been working on kind of like creating a kind of multi-layered thing so that when they're in the water, they can be on any level of the water and we can show it accurately. I wonder, so just looking at the Ablis stat block, it says, like, whenever the charmed target takes damage, the target can repeat a saving throw. So, like, do can you free its slaves? I assume you would be able to. I did not. By hurting them? <laughs> I See, that's like the thing. I, those, those, a lot of stat blocks in 5th edition, or any edition, because they have to gamify it, so it has to be, and it also has to be fun. So, even though in lore that like if you don't cure that disease of the mucus immediately then you would you you would have to do a really high level spell to free yourself in D &D, they're not going to make that because that's not very fun i think they might have made it for a previous edition that's why it was there but they've really gone away from any of those like save or be screwed kind of saves and so they're they're not going to make anything like that I forget there's there's a few other ones where I've learned about the lore of them and they're like ridiculously strong but they don't talk about any of that because it would make them really unfair <laughs> in D&D. Yeah, I mean I guess that makes makes sense, but you could even make a campaign kind of built off of that if you wanted. Like you could build a campaign off of the players are freeing slaves, which I think is almost kind of a little bit of what we were talking about in the first one too. But yeah. you could totally make a whole campaign based off of people who have been enslaved by this entity or this civilization or empire where you have to go in and you're, you're freeing them essentially, which I think would be a really fun campaign. So. Yeah, I would probably make it be something other than hitting them. <laughs> you just hit them until they make their save. <laughs> yeah, just keep punching him. Make Monks would be great in that campaign. <laughs> just run through and just punch everybody. That would but be so funny. <laughs> no, I'd make it again. That would be a silly campaign. I would make it something like a um, special amulet or something that only works on on uh, one person at a time, and you kind of had to I mean, slip it on them and wait for it to take effect. I mean, if we're going for our, like church thing that we were just talking about, church, you could make a whole combat where like they have to destroy the fountain in order for them to like snap out of their their charmed effect, essentially. So you could make a combat revolving around this fountain that they have to destroy while also fighting off enemies in order to like free these people from their bonds and their their chains essentially that'd be a really fun combat yeah the thing is i really like the idea of it being a permanent thing like you're permanently you know this knowledge and so it might be a thing to destroy it to to kind of 
not allow them to do it to anybody else. But I like the idea of it being permanent. And so if well, a player could... gets it, it's permanent. They know this knowledge. Yeah. Well, I guess you could you could make it where like their knowledge is essentially put into the pool. So when you drink it, your knowledge is put into the pool. Mm -hmm. So like if they destroy this, your knowledge is also getting destroyed at the same time. So then if a player does drink it, it also actively hurts them to destroy the fountain because it's destroying their collective pool of knowledge as well. That actually just your, your idea just created a it's so cool. I, what I oh man, having a character that is like so good and so happy with the world and they have to be the one to drink from the fountain so that their knowledge about what is good and what is right in the world goes into, into the, everybody's head. Yeah. Something like that. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, so you could you could literally make this like fountain. Essentially, you share your knowledge with everybody with who's already take, partaken in drinking the fountain. And so yeah. if you destroy it, it actively hurts your mind as well and hurts all of those that are a part of the fountain. It'd be a really, really fun idea. Yeah, I like the idea of just like implanting this idea of the world is better than you think. And so they will slowly start like getting people that are not a hundred percent in on this church anymore because they have been, they know all the knowledge and they started to see that, Hey, maybe the church isn't the best or the, yeah. Or the party, or you could make it like the party actively is trying to summon their God to come and impart, like impart the good of the world into the fountain to change mm. the people of the church, which would be really, really fun too. That would be, yeah. Which it could be like a, um, you have to do like a high level, I don't know, what spell would that be? Like contact other plane or is there, a, what, what spell is it to summon a high level celestial? Yeah, uh, there's planar ally, but. There's also the one about building the temple. To, yeah, that's temple of the gods, I think, or yeah, temple. Um, I don't remember. One of my cleric is, is using both of those spells in, <laughs> in our, in my current game. So. Hmm. But you could even do like a modify memory spell on the fountain or something to try and eliminate memories. Yeah, the problem with that is like I had a problem in my campaign is where if you give them a solution that they could just spam and you're like, oh, yeah. this is not the solution. This is just a thing that happens to work because you were really smart and you thought, hey, maybe I try this. And, and then they just spam that to solve it and you're like it's not fun to do that if you just keep waiting and casting <laughs> modify memory as many times as you can it's not fun it's not enjoyable for the other players either yeah i mean at the same time it kind of is though because like you came up with this idea that was able to solve the issue but i get that i get where you're coming from where like they just spend 12 days just resting over and over again so they can cast modify memory yeah i created i created a it was one of the characters mothers and uh, she was kind of infected by these scales and she'd kind of become this other creature that had kind of like tainted her. And so everywhere that a scale was growing, there was this nodule and it was a nodule of magic that they could kind of sense. And so they tried dispelling one and it worked. The scale didn't fall off, but it, it the nodule went away. They had to roll really high and it kept getting higher and higher and higher and harder and harder to do. And so it was it was supposed to kind of be like hey like don't <laughs> you don't need to do this all the time it's going to get harder and harder and it's going to be pretty much impossible to keep doing but they just kept doing it and it was like half the session and it was very boring and i was like i, I part way through i was like guys please like there's there is a real there are real solutions you can come up with this for this that are not this that are not going to be one by one knocking out all 30 of these things i mean they found other ways and they started using other spells but it was still like yeah. a slog and anybody who wasn't engaged, who didn't have spells, was just, like, really bored. And I was like, ah, this was not the intended solution for this. Yeah, like, yeah, that kind of, that kind of like, splits the party in a bad way, too. Like you yeah. said, with people who can't cast spells, people who can. It would be kind of a rough thing for them. But, you know, I mean, I think High Rollers did it really well. I don't know if you've gotten to that part where they had Probably to, not. like, close the portal of Hadar. And so it's a really good... He made it pretty engaging and pretty good. Still kind of, because he used the whole, like, you have to spend a spell slot in order to, like, tie it together, um, tie, the, tie the portal closed. And the people without spell slots could, like, 
try and use magical effects on their items to like close it and stuff like that but it just wasn't just not as useful as like spellcasters mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's a problem when you when you get to high level campaigns and you're dealing with magical creatures of great strength and you're like it only really makes sense that magic could stop this or magic could do this or you could heal this with magic and so you just give them good armor and give them good <laughs> good weapons and you're like i hope i hope that helps i hope you enjoy yeah. playing <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's kind of... That's where some campaigns go, though. There's some campaigns that enjoy just doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think I, I think my where we're at right now is uh, engaging to all the players, not just the ones who can cast spells. There is stuff for those people that cast spells, though. There is unique stuff that they're dealing with trying to create spells now that they're high enough level and they're trying to invest in that as much, much as they can. But then there's other stuff that the other players are engaging with which is actually making it interesting for them and whatnot you trying to use their backstory to aid them and whatnot yeah and that's the ideal sweet spot you kind of want to be in <laughs> where like everybody can participate in play and not you know using their abilities or their backstories and not be like stuck with not being able to cast a spell so they can't do anything about it yeah that's why I, yeah it's it's hard to, to get a equal player engagement a lot of times with every single storyline. And so finding yeah. ways that they can use their unique skill sets in every situ in every like thing that they're doing. That's one of the things that Matt Mercer is really, really good at is like yes, they're following Jester's plotline now, or yes, they're following Ford's, but they're everybody kinda has a like in those dungeons and whatnot they go through it feels like everybody's having a chance to do what they're good at. Yasha can break something or they need her to lift something or then, then they need Caduceus to speak with dead or do some sort of death thing. And they all kind of have their moments in those focusing moments. Yeah. I mean, I would also give a whole lot of credit to the players in that campaign, because yes. girl girl especially because they're like really good at like, Role playing and stuff, so they can seem a part of something when they're really not, because they're role playing or, you know, they're really good at that kind of stuff. And if you don't have a group that, you know, is that super into role playing, then it it becomes a little bit harder. It's true, yeah. And that's where you kind of have to take a, a deeper dive into mechanics, or even add something into your world, such such as like the ability to, you know, find different weapons or something like that that can help people without that kind of stuff. Or just avoiding using the whole, you can only do this by casting spells. Yeah. That's why I enjoy, like, uh, really diving into players' backstories. Which, even, like, the small ones, where they don't want to take time to make a whole huge backstory because they don't enjoy it. And just being able to, even if they're not focusing on their character, they're, like, in a part of the world where they have a friend or somebody from the backstory is there and it kind of engages them in a way as well yeah and that's that's why i personally always have like my players make like at least a page long of some sort of backstory um just because it it's i think it's more fun for most everybody involved when you're when the dm's able to like dip into people's backstories and throw things in that they you know had written about in their backstory and stuff i think that's really where the in my opinion, where some of the most fun comes from in D&D. Uh, yes, I definitely agree. And and from my first campaign, I had a lot of new players at that point, And we, we're still playing in our second campaign now. And they were very um, short. Uh, the backstories they gave me and kind of the details in it weren't weren't very usable. It was very either finished like everything in the backstory is solidly concluded at the end there's no reason to bring anything up or it's so out of the way that they're they never go there or then there's no way for them to engage with it and so they were really good uh when we started our second campaign now that they learned like hey like this is how we should write it now and they really came with some really good backstories that are really engageable and it's it's really been fun and I actually saw it on a TikTok, it was a suggestion that he does with his players every time he starts a campaign is he has them come up with 
three rumors. So just like it could, these rumors could be from anywhere in the world, but they're about your character. Two of them have to be real. One of them is a lie. And so just by like having them think of that on top of creating the, the backstory, they have to think about what does the world see of you? Who are you to this world? Even if you're like a nobody, somebody at least has talked gossip about you. And what do they think? And it kind of makes them think in a way that is more than just who is my character. Yeah, I give my players like a whole like, not questionnaire, but like a questionnaire essentially to like fill out to help with like character creation so that they can like easily look through what, you know, you know, what was your family like? Like that kind of stuff. So they can like easily fill out stuff like that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I got one off the internet that I like to to kind of think through it's not it's not even a like it's it's for an after you finish out your backstory or at least it might be for helping you think of one um and you kind of just go through it and so it, it's just a questionnaire that if you if you know the answer to all these questions then you're fully ready to play your care and so i create the backstory and then i kind of go through this questionnaire and make sure i have like all this kind of extra stuff thought about at least yeah i mean that's kind of how i how I've kind of done it essentially just making this whole like questionnaire. And then also it's really important to always be in contact with your players as they're making their characters for, for various reasons, <laughs> but just being yeah. able to like, but I, I mean, I, I know for a lot of DMS, like even some of my players, they, they, they love creating characters, but they're, they're busy. They're, they're busy in their lives. And so they, they don't have the ability to, <laughs> to talk to me as much. And like even one of them, it took a few sessions in before I even got their full backstory. But they they still had enough given to me by the beginning that their character was interesting and engaging for the rest of the party as well and for them. And so even those who aren't able to give as much backstory, like you can still do a lot with that. And I think the questionnaire might be a, a good way to go for those people who, who are not able to write a whole backstory just taking time to fill out this quick, like mine was like 24 questions. I think it was a 24 question questionnaire of just like simply what age are you? When were you born? Who are your parents? Who are your siblings? Things like that. It's yeah, easier to I go think. through something like that. It created, go through a checklist than just to write an essay about <laughs> who I am. No. Yeah. I think it's probably easier for everybody to do that kind of thing, which is why I normally have people use a questionnaire Mine's a little bit more broad than that, though, but because m my players enjoy writing and making backstories, so, like, mine's a little bit more, like, broad in scope, um, so it's easier for them to kind of fill out. Hmm. Well, not easier, I guess more freedom when they're filling it out than, like, what's your age? What's your name? You know, it's more like, tell me something that, you know, like a detriment that your character has and how it was caused, you know, that type of thing. Hmm. Could you post it in the Discord? And then maybe yeah, we could put it, it up. Maybe we could put <laughs> yes. it up somewhere so that people can see it. Yeah, we could put in the description up. where we put it up. Yeah, it's somewhere buried in my notes, but yeah, I could totally find it. Yeah, I might just post it on like Imgur or something. Yeah, I think that'd be a, a good idea. Yeah. Um, well, I was also thinking, randomly, I was also thinking if you wanted to just throw an abolith into your game without really having to use a whole lot of backstory, just throwing it in. Um, I was thinking you could do like an underwater library or like a, or just something like a, the Abolith essentially just guarding some sort of source of knowledge that the players need to get to. So that'd be just a really easy, like easy way just to throw it in without having to like die. Now I just recently though. watched this. So it's fresh, fresh ish on my mind. The library in Avatar, I was guarded That's like exactly. a giant owl, right? That's exactly what I was thinking, yeah. Okay, I'm glad we're on the same wave. Like, like having that kind of underwater and somehow there being like a bubble of air. And so when they originally go down there, they don't see an Avalith. But he's like watching and the moment they like heard a book or take a book down, like he's there to be like, yeah, like no, that would be interesting. Knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Like and he doesn't even have to that. show his face because he's psychic. So he could just like scream it in their brain, put it back or something. And then they could have an interesting encounter and not even know it was an Abolith. And that's still enjoyable and fun without having to say, hey, look, you're talking to this creature who's in D&D. &D. Yeah, it's just a fun way to throw in the creature without having to, like, 
dive in too deeply into what the creature is actually about and how it's formed and you know what why it has the abilities it has just just to be able to throw it into a, a temple or a library essentially that it's guarding some sort of secret knowledge that it's that it thinks it's it that it's like that it thinks is like it's so you can just have your characters interact with it that way that took a little while to come out <laughs> yeah well that it thinks it <laughs> is 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 <laughs> yeah that was a lot of it's and is that's really hard to say <laughs> It was, but in the end, it made sense, and it did. that it thinks is is <laughs> slowly but surely. I got there, you know. Well, this has been a uh, another recording of Dungeoneered. We rambled a, a bit farther from the topic on this one, <laughs> but I think it was still a good episode. And thank you for listening. See you next time. No, I'm not gonna throw in your thing at the end. Why? <laughs> <laughs>